they can only make decisions or judgments based on what they see. And that, again, raises another interesting but all too common topic. People don't talk about money. And now. <laughs> aye, aye. I'm the captain now. <laughs> Coming to you from the K2 studios in San Diego, California. This sounds great. You sound amazing. I always sound amazing. It's the world famous. Everybody sit off like BFFs. Chris and Christine Show. Hey, what's happening, everybody? How are you doing today? Thank you so much for listening, and I am Chris. And I'm Christine, and welcome to episode 123 of the Chris and Christine Show. Do 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 do. Yes, fantastic, glorious, as we come to you on a Sunday evening, right after watching the world-famous Oscars. Yeah, and uh, what happened on those Oscars, Chris? Well, all I know is that I was getting dinner ready, and I was about <laughs> to plate food. I went to, shout out to Costco, went and got us some pre-made, uh, what did I get us? Um, chicken Alfredo? Yes, chicken Alfredo. Easy in the oven, simple to make, Okay, by the get way. to the punchline. Then I was plating the dinner, and I'm watching the Oscars, and the TV kind of mutes out. Like, the screen kind of goes blank for a second, and I'm like, what is going on? Was there a bad moment that we might have missed in America here that they cut out to? You did not say that right then. You thought nothing of it. You just thought it was muted, something happened, and then you didn't think anything until what, like 30 minutes later, 20 minutes later, we're sitting on the couch, and what popped up? On my Twitter feed or Instagram, one of the feeds, I saw this meme or I saw videos. I actually it saw, was a meme, right? No, I actually think the first thing I saw was a video of uh, Chris Rock up on stage and uh, Will Smith gr- walking up to the stage after that. Like, And all these ha- hashtags and taglines were like, oh my goodness, did that just happen? And Oh, yeah. It was, a, it was like a reel or something on Instagram. Right, I, that's what right, it was because right. you were like – did you see what happened? And I'm like, no, show me. And you're like, well, I can't watch it if you're watching it. And I'm like, well, I had no clue what you're talking about. And I was like, can you just show me your phone? And all I see is like Will Smith walking off the stage. I'm like, uh, okay. And then I clicked on it because you said, I don't know how to watch it again. I was well, like, well, I was on Instagram Reels. And, and for whatever reason, there was not a rewind button on that one. I don't yeah, know. you have to click watch again. Well, I didn't see that button either, so mm-hmm. I just handed you my phone, and you watched it again, and we all watched it again. I think the world watched it many, <laughs> many times. And if you don't know what we are talking about, we are talking about a man defending the honor of his wife, maybe in the not most socially acceptable manner. However, I don't typically condone violence, but I will say bravo, Will Smith, for standing up for your wife, especially as she's been de- battling some health concerns and that is the reason why she has a bald head and chris rock i mean he is always edgy when it comes to his comedy but this was just it was not okay i mean and i hope that i hope that after this yes you know will smith did apologize when he had his acceptance speech from the oscars to the academy but did he really apologize to uh no, he doesn't need to apologize to Chris Rock. The, what, who was he apologizing to for? To the Academy for oh, making bringing disrespect, yeah, and taking the focus off of the awards and the the importance of the night. I don't believe he owes an apology to Chris Rock. I hope Chris Rock apologizes to Jada Pinkett Smith for his comments about her being potentially on like GI Jane too. Like that was a low blow. I would hope. I would sincerely hope. While I don't condone violence, that if somebody was to insult me like that, that you would defend my honor. Of course, it would, baby. Would you punch them though? I don't know. I don't want to go. You know, I don't go about a prisoner or like that for that kind of stuff. But um, I was going to say that, like, I think that uh, Will Smith. You know, he was uh, he was very heated and and he was cussing that you hear him screaming. You know, f bombs. Well, it wasn't just f bombs. He said, "Don't don't." Like, take my wife's name out of your effing mouth is what he said. I always said, I told you this earlier. I said, do you think, I know all the stuff on there is very scripted. Like, they have a very much, like, you have teleprompters and everything's right in front of them. Do you think it's possible that maybe he was just reading a teleprompter and that was on the screen? No, because you could see that he was, like, totally joking because he was, like, talking about, you know, one guy and his wife both being up for Oscars. And he was, like, jabbing at him. There was, like... I would say that that was like the freestyling component. Like it was like he was freestyling and like 
you know, trying to get the crowd going. And that's why I think so many of these shows are so super scripted so that things like this don't happen. And they have a long delay. I think uh, usually it's like eight to 10 second delay that for things like this happen. So when it happens live in real time, the, the, the crewmen or the camera guys behind the scenes can like push buttons and go away or cut away or take the, right. you know, everything off. Like we get, like our feed here didn't have anything that we saw in Australia mm -hmm. and other places of the world where we saw the actual live feed that did not get <laughs> edited. We saw the whole thing, which is crazy. Everyone's like shocked what happened, you know? So, and it was kind of funny. Even Amy Schumer, who was one of the hosts tonight, mm -hmm. she comes out later. She's like, did something happen? Uh, everybody seems, everybody seems kind of weird in here. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. And there was, um, yeah, Sean P. Diddy Combs came out and he was like, Right after, this is what you and I heard, and we didn't even clue into anything because he made a comment about, we're going to handle this like family, Will and Chris, da, da, da. And we were like, oh, okay. And then like Will Smith was laughing and or chuckling. And you and I were like, D did we miss something? And so that is the big story of the night is what happened at the Oscars. And, you know, I remember one time, Chris, you and I were dating. And I remember we had the top down on the Camaro. And... First of all, when you are in the car with me, you make me so nervous when we're driving because you're like, why? Because you're like, go, you know, do this, do that, do that. And I'm like, I don't need a backseat car jockey. And I remember this one time we had the top down. We were on our way going to, I don't even know. And you told me to tap on the horn because this guy was like paused at a green light. And so I was like, I don't want to do that, Chris. You're like, just tap on the horn. I was like, I don't like honking at people, Chris. It's rude. And you were like, tap on the horn. The guy's not moving. So I did this like, I meant to go doo doo, but it went. Er, er. I thought it was more like that. aggressive. No, maybe. there was no more aggressive honking. I didn't want to honk anyway. So then I honk at this guy and then we end up pulling behind beside him and he rolls down his window and starts screaming profanity at me, calling me fat and calling me the B word. And so you're like, get away, get away. And so I like turned. You no, can't re you can't reason with crazy. Yeah, you can't reason with crazy. So then we go and we're like right by Kane's Chicken and in Santee. And I turned into the parking lot to get away and like go the back way. And the guy screams at me, that's right, you fat effing bee. Go over. I knew you were going to get fast food. And I remember after I was so upset. I was like, Chris, you didn't even say anything to him. And what did you say? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember, actually. Yeah, you were like. I didn't want to get arrested. And I was like, defend my honor. Would you have pulled a Will Smith? Uh, more than that, probably. I would have done probably more than that. You would know? you? Yeah, well, definitely. You know, And the thing is, too, is you got to be careful because um, now that I think about what you're just saying now, what if Will Smith actually gets the charges brought against him for he that? He could. You know, that's a very serious thing. Yeah, it could be assault charges. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's, I mean, that, that could be career, I mean, for someone like me or, or for some, you know, someone like you, for example, that could be career ending, you know? Yeah, it could be. However, with that being said, I mean, yes, definitely Chris Rock can press charges. But in the investigation, like there would be a lot of public pressure against him for it's like that whole don't dish it out if you can't take the heat. You know, that kind right. of thing. You know, I was kind of thinking that, too. I was kind of wondering if Chris Rock is probably going to be like just mellow, lay low for a while. And, and this could be a bad thing for Chris Rock. He may not get hired anywhere after this either. Well, it? they took him off the stage. Like he oh. was supposed to be like, I think he was supposed to be the host for the evening, wasn't he? No, no, there was three hosts. It was two, three women. It was the. Um, oh, it was Wanda Sykes and Amy Schumer and. The other girl, I don't know who she is. Oh, I know who she is, but I'm blanking out on her name. But right anyways, now. there were three, three women. Okay, got it. So the point is that he was just a, a presenter, just doing like the. Ooh, um, well, they'll have, they'll have he'll never get asked again. Maybe not. I. Why well, don't? That's the thing. See, I was kind of wondering. All of these things usually have to get passed by like the people upstairs. To, like, Except if you're a comedian and you just do off-the-cuff no, stuff. No, they don't – no, every – when it's in the – we talk the Oscars here. We're not talking about like a random night at the Cuckoo Club. We're talking I, about the Oscars here. No, I know, but there's unscripted parts, but, you know, I've just – Not like that. When there's a joke, I think – No, they, there are times when there's jokes that are made that are off-the-cuff. I guarantee you it was not scripted. I don't think scripted. that was. I think that, I think that was part of a – of a script or kind of a kind of a thing he already had written out and, and even he wasn't reading it it was already kind of pre-planned pre out okay because, so because no. they already were already panned over that area with the cameras and stuff and he was trying to talk it but he was because will smith was in the front row he was in the front row and they didn't actually they went to jada 
after he said it and you could see her face fall. And, you know, I was just thinking about this. I think, first of all, I don't believe that the Oscars would have scripted that. And the reason why is Will Smith was a contender for um, like best actor. And, and, I just, and he won, by the way. Right. But I was just thinking about this. His whole night is now going to be overshadowed by this event of Chris Rock creating an unnecessary situation by saying something that absolutely did not need to be said. And I'm very angry that he decided to, you know, put the light on a woman who's struggling with a health condition to push her husband into a situation like if he wouldn't have stood up for her, if Will Smith didn't like because he didn't have the option of like, I mean, I guess he did of like getting up and walking out no, in the um, middle of it, in yeah. the middle of the filming. And so he like had his head backed around a corner. I did notice, though, that that stage was really low. It was like one step up from the ground. Oh, yeah. So it was like it was like walking up to a patio. <laughs> yeah. It was like there was no bouncers. But with that being said, that was the craziness of tonight that we both were just like debating this over what just happened. And then second of all. Would my husband actually defend my honor like that? Hmm. Would you? Yeah, baby, I would. Of course Would you? Of course, baby doll. Well, enough about the Oscars tonight. I know that's always a hot topic. You know, who won, who didn't win. And some, and what's funny is that I was was tweeting during the Oscars after. It sounds inappropriate. You were tweeting? uh, Some people were. It's a thing people do. They tweet during uh, game shows and awards and things like that. So I was uh, noticing that the movie Dune won like a whole bunch. And I'm like. I tweet out like, I guess I probably should see this movie do, and it's like a big thing. Like, oh. I, like, 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 okay, are we really gonna do? Th- are we really gonna talk about this right now? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I had a wedding yesterday, and I came home, and we were like hanging out on the couches in the living room after. Oh, that's right, it was on TV but last night. Yeah. It came on last night, and you and and Jacob were like, I almost said you and Chris Jr. <laughs> you and Jacob, yeah, were like. We want to watch this Dune. It looks good. And I was like, uh, this looks ridiculous. Like, what is this? Why? No, this looks so dumb. I don't want to watch it. And you're like, it's supposed to be you really good. You weren't even good. watching the TV when you were saying, you're like, look at your phone I know. I was that. like, this is so dumb. I don't want to watch this. And I finally convinced you to not watch it. And what did we watch instead? Uh, office reruns. <laughs> the reruns of The Office. Maybe I should have let you watch that well, movie. Yeah, well, it still would have stopped it from winning. Like, I don't know how many Academy Awards it won. Like, three or four? Maybe maybe five. I don't know. What a bunch. I, I know that. It's like, I, after one of its first two, I'm thinking, like, maybe this movie is actually a big deal. And maybe we should check it out. I think it's going to be, like, if you remember Mad Max, I made you watch Mad mm-hmm. Max. Mad Max won a ton of Oscars the year it was in, for the Academy Awards. So bizarre. Are, but go ahead right i think i thought dune would have been like the mad max from back then it was kind of this crazy like sci-fi kind of thing this is the year of the four letter movies so it was like dune and was the other one coda that's the one that won yeah coda and dune i don't know lots of four letter words this year but uh you know between will smith coda and dune that's hey, right that was really good that was like morning radio good there you go <laughs> hey, you want to hire us well, you know you know you can't afford us but you know if you want to yeah, hire you want to throw us a bone maybe uh <laughs> give us an offer we can look at it we'll look it over talk to our agent we'll see yeah definitely well let's fast forward or rewind actually <laughs> There that was go. my rewind sound to yesterday. Great. I love it. So uh, what's been going on in your week, Chris, and what have been your highlights? Well, one of the highlights was I went to help you at the wedding yesterday. Because sure Christine did. had a wedding, which wasn't that far from the house here, which I always love it when you have a wedding venue that's really close to home. I know. Because it's like you can come back here, you can change, you can get stuff you need, go back to the house, and you need my help taking a bunch of stuff over to the venue. A bunch yep, of I like. Did. So I love the truck up, went over there, and your friend uh, Kelsey was there helping you out, and you guys did your wedding thing, which is fantastic. You girls come in. It was funny. Kelsey comes in here, and then she comes in the bathroom, changes, flips out, and she looks amazing, all dolled up like a Superman when he gives yeah. them a, goes in the phone booth. And he <laughs> what about changed. me? You look great too, baby. Oh, you said she looked amazing, <laughs> and I looked great. Come on now. No, you look amazing too, baby. Okay, thank you. So you guys go over to the uh, wedding thing, and then later that night, you ask me, um, I need your help picking stuff up right you know so i grabbed some flashlights because you're my strong man i know and i bring the kids with me too no it, you didn't I, last night didn't. you left him home oh that's right i left him home i did bring yep. him, i did bring him earlier when we were loading the first stuff over the first trip right earlier. so on the last trip it gets dark over there early so we're over there in the dark and i'm you know loading everything up on the little hand dolly <laughs> hand cart and this random girl from the wedding comes over to me and says hey are you chris from the chris and christine show 
<laughs> and I said, well, yes, I am. <laughs> and okay, ladies and gentlemen, and I like, have to, no, I'm I have like, to, uh, I have why, to pause why do you, you ask? I have to pause no, you. No, no, pause. Don't, yes. don't ruin my glory. I do need to, I have to pause you because when she tapped you on the shoulder or she was like, uh, when she asked that question, you turned around like, I don't know, like you were on the red carpet at the Oscars, like, oh, who is this that wants my autograph? <laughs> okay, you I, can pick back up. So, yes, exactly what happened. I'm like, oh, really? Oh, yeah, that sure is it, you know? And uh, Did you think she was a true listener? I, in fact, I th- think I did. I thought yeah. I, I thought I did because, um, you know, listeners everywhere, you know? Mm-hmm. You, you just never know, you know? So I thought it was, and although it was not because Christine told her about the show. And well, I told everybody about the show, so I ended up having to be the MC for the evening. The couple hadn't hired a DJ. They had somebody that was doing sound for them, but um, I was, like, kind of running the show, just, you know, doing announcements and things like that, and I... I guess I can completely relate to Chris Rock on like the trying to come up with jokes and things to like. Oh, did you, did you, did you say, hey, the bride's wearing white today? Uh. No. Oh, no, Chris. <laughs> I made okay, I made different little jokes. I, OK, so here's how I started out the evening. I was like, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Christine and I will be your wedding singer for the evening. And the bride and groom looked at me like. What? I was like, just joking. You don't want to hear this. And so I was like the MC and I was making little jokes. And what happened is the bride's sister gave a speech and the speech was really good. And I was telling her, well, you know, um, well, I'm not telling her. I told everybody after the first speech was done. I said, my husband and I, we have a podcast and on it just a couple of weeks ago, we interviewed someone who's an expert in speech writing And he talked about how to give the perfect wedding toast. And I said to the bride's sister, without even knowing it, you followed the formula because that was absolutely beautiful. And I just want to clone you. And so then after the wedding, when we were doing all of the cleanup, she came over and she was like, what is the name of your podcast? I'm totally going to listen. And I told her and she's like, what do you guys talk about? And I said, oh, well. We're talking about you actually right now. (laughs) (laughs) So I was um, just like telling her a little bit about it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, my husband is he's here. He's around here somewhere helping me out. And he would absolutely love it if you would tell him that you want to listen to our podcast, like that you love podcasts because he's like a huge podcast fan. And she's like, no, really? Uh, I'll go. I'll go talk to him right now. Where is he? And I was like, oh, where is he? And then I saw that you were getting the big lawn game. So I was like, oh, he's right there. And she was like, so I can go up to him and I can be like, so is this the Chris from <laughs> the Chris and Christine show? And I said, do it. Her name's Greta. I was like, you have to because you will literally make his life. Uh, you did. <laughs> yep, yep. And she really is going to listen, which oh, is awesome. Well, I'm just going to pretend that she's already a fan. And <laughs> she is a fan without even listening. There you go. Yeah. So and in fact, I tweeted that all about this this morning. <laughs> I said, crazy things happen, you know, and some girl <laughs> says, hey, are you Chris and the Chris and Christine show? I said, yes, I am. And you show her your ring. <laughs> well, I, that's neither here nor there, but I'm saying like, <laughs> you know, if you want to take a selfie or an autograph, anything, yeah, you know, I mean, like, anything yeah. want to autograph for you? Like, Talk you know, to my agent. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? You know, we, we have book signings coming up here. If I have a book, you know, it's like a pop-up book, but I'm working on it, you know. <laughs> so was that a highlight of your week? A highlight of my life, I think. I <laughs> I have to say, you know, I, it's- you do love podcasting. Okay, I have to say this. So tonight, the two littles have been. Uh, we are when you say dealing littles, with I mean little kids. The littles, yeah, we call them the littles. The I, twelve call, and the nine year old. You call them littles. I call them other things, but yeah. <laughs> tonight, I may have called them other things, but we are in this phase of parenting where the children do not want to shower. Yeah, you know, I was actually a pretty stinky kid myself and didn't take a lot of showers, really. What? I know. I know. It's hard to believe. What made you snap out of it, though? I think when I realized I could not get a girlfriend. (laughs) Yeah, you know, girls do like a clean guy. That's for sure. Yeah, I think it was something around there. I think I went from, like, playing with toys and boys and, like, boys to stuff to, like, want to be interested in girls. And I think at some point I was realizing that if I – was clean and, and and I think also too when you're when you're younger you don't realize your bo until you really realize your bo <laughs> and there's that kind of awkward phase where like I think that if you're playing a lot of sports and you're a lot sweaty quite a bit and 
even as a kid, you do get some BO happening. And I think that let's not talk about BO. Oh, I know it's not, it's not smell yeah. of vision here. Yeah, but um, but th- you did turn a corner because now you're the opposite. Like you really like to shower and you like to everything to be clean. Like I'm trying not to just watch you, all, all, like- the, all the all the film. It's like when I shower, it's like I'm just getting a whole new me again. So <laughs> it's like all my sins are just washed off. All your sins are washed away every, every single time I shower. All right, we're going to church today. Uh, it's exactly. It's like I'm baptizing myself every time I go to shower. It's like, everything is washed right off of me, and I feel like. I can do anything oh now. gosh, Chris Rock and Chris Smith here. Okay, so what's funny is when we were watching the Oscars earlier, I was trying to say Chris Rock, and there's Chris Rock and Will Smith, and I kept calling him Chris Smith, and you're like, hey, that's me, that's not him. I know. Well, you know, you know, poor Will. You know, he is related to me, by the way. Oh, is he? Yeah. Well, you know, last name, last name. So it's uh, down the chain somewhere. Yeah. You know? Oh my gosh, I forgot to tell you that one of my brides coming up is getting married and is going to have the same last name. So I keep calling her like, just not just wedding bestie, but you know. My sister from another mister. There you go. Yeah, Yeah. fantastic. Well, it's been an interesting couple of days and an interesting uh, week for me. You know, work has been super busy and I've been like kicking it into high gear and then had weddings and consulting. And, you know, as I've been going through all of these things, Chris, it's made me really be thinking about like our future, especially now going from being a mother of one to a mom slash stepmom of three uh, one of the things that I think a lot about, I don't know if you know this about me, is like what, not to be grim here, but what was the ha- what would happen to you if something happened to me and I wasn't able to like help bring an income into the house? Like, would you be okay? Uh, never, baby. At first, I'd miss you. No income could replace you, baby. Don't. Oh, well, thank you so much. I mean, but how much are we getting here? How much are we talking about? <laughs> I'm just going to calculate that. Click, 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 click. How much? How much? You're such a goofball. But I do think about that a lot. And so one of the things that I've been wrestling with is like how to plan for the future and how it's different sometimes for women. And I'm very excited about the fact that this week's guest is a specialist in this specific area in supporting women with wealth management, especially around that retirement age. And we're going to be back with him right after this. Hey, thank you so much for being a loyal listener of the Chris and Christine show. And as that you are a loyal listener, we have a very fun opportunity for you to get involved with the show. Ooh, tell me more. If you like to get exclusive content you can't get anywhere else and to receive free merchandise shipped to you every single month. Ooh, I want that. Then head over to patreon.com slash the Chris and Christine show. That is patreon.com slash the chris and christine show welcome back to the show everybody today on the chris and christine show we have a financial advisor with 25 years experience in the business please welcome to the show russ thornton thanks for the warm welcome i'm excited to be here today yeah we're excited to have you here russ thank you so much for joining us we've been Really looking forward to this interview with you because I think that I am going to learn a lot. Chris, are you ready to learn a lot? Hey, baby, I'm always ready to learn. <laughs> Not to say I put in practice, but I always learn. <laughs> awesome. Well, Russ, where in the world are you joining us from today? I am based in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, but actually today uh, I am talking to you from uh, Lake Oconee, which is about an hour and a half outside of Atlanta, where we uh, are. Super fortunate to have a second home. So my wife and I and our dog are out here today. Oh, that's amazing. Is it like a big lake where you can boat on it or is it like a little small pond lake? It is is not a pond. It's a big lake. So yeah, boating, the whole fishing, the whole nine yards. So it's it's a several thousand acre lake. So yeah, it's pretty good size. That sounds amazing. Now, I might sound a little dumb when I ask this question, but... I don't know if this is the case. In the waterways in Georgia, do you have a fear of gators like they do down in like the Florida area? So it's super, it's funny you, you asked that there. I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the next door app. It's kind of this community mm-hmm. based yeah, app. Yeah, I have that. So, app. Yeah, yeah. So inevitably, every few months, there are always like claimed gator sightings and things like that on the lake out here. But but it's a little too chilly up here. So no, we do not have any any gators in the lake up here. So we've got some big fish, but uh, nothing nothing to be worried about when you're out in the lake swimming or skiing or tubing or anything like that. Is that catfish? Yeah, we got some big cat. It's a, it's a big catfish lake and um, 
bass and it's actually crappy season right now or, or what I think the northerners refer to as crappie. But yeah, it's, okay, a, okay. it's, a, big, it's a big fishing lake. <laughs> when you said crappy season, I was like, what is that? Is it just like mean it's a crappy fish season? So that's an actual breed of fish? It's an actual breed of fish and they're actually pretty tasty. Okay. So do you do a lot of fishing off your uh, pier or whatever you have, your boat dock? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I, I probably fish more from the bank in the dock than I do out in the boat. But um, yeah, I, I love to fish. I just uh, don't make near enough time for it. Uh, fishing takes time. That's one thing I would say is that like it's – you got to spend it, an entire day, I think. You really <laughs> got to dedicate to do some fishing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. My dad used to take us fishing a lot. I was raised in a family of four girls. And all I know is my mom would be sitting in the bow of the boat reading a book. And us girls would all be dying because all we wanted to do was go swim in the lake around the boat. And my dad was adamant that we were not to even touch the water because he didn't want us to scare away the fish. So finally, we would convince him to like drop us off on the the shore while he went out fishing with my mom so we could go swimming. <laughs> hey, Russ, what is the largest fish you ever caught? The largest fish I've ever caught was probably um, saltwater fishing. I caught a 50 plus pound uh, amberjack, but that's probably Whoa. been, that's been 20 years ago. The largest freshwater fish I've caught was probably fly fishing for trout out west. This was, again, many years ago. Uh, we went out to Utah on the Green River and we caught, you know, several two, three, four pound uh, trout, which which catching them on a fly rod is a, uh, a really, really cool experience. Now, do you have photos of that? Because there's that infamous, if you didn't photograph it and <laughs> right. somebody wasn't around, it didn't happen. I do. Um, the, you know, this was this was long enough ago where, where I think the photos are actually on like uh, film. Huh? So I don't they're not they're not stored away in my Google Photos account or my iCloud account or anything like that. But I, I actually do have photographic proof that these uh, these events did occur. Well, now, good now on the you. big the big one, you know, do you have it on your wall, like, like stuffed <laughs> or whatever above your fireplace? Uh, no, I did not. So this we went out uh, charter fishing uh, again, ages and ages ago. My dad, my brothers and I and um we, I think we, as I recall, I think we uh, let the uh, charter captain and their crew keep most of the fish because we were, it was a trip for us. And we, frankly, we didn't want to deal with hauling, you know, hauling and, and ultimately cleaning fish. And that, oh, yeah. that's a, that's a whole, um, that's a whole involved thing right there. So I think we wound up giving it to the, to the captain and the crew. Absolutely. My brother-in-law is a very avid fisher and he went up to Alaska and was doing a bunch of that fishing and they chartered a boat where included in it was they would clean all of your fish and package them up and put them on you know dry ice so you could ship them back. And I was like, man, that's worth its weight in gold because after a whole day of fishing, last thing that you want to be doing is being covered in fish guts. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's the way to do it. That's the package deal. Yeah, definitely. Well, so how long have you had this second house out there on the lake? We uh, so the the very short version of a long and twisting story is we've had a lake house for about twelve years now. This is actually our our second lake house on a second lake, and uh, again, I'll spare you the details. But long story short, is our first our first house was like an old mobile home. It was like a great like weekend lake house, just kind of go and hang out. And we went out for a long weekend one time, opened the door, and uh, we heard water running. And oh no. That's never a good thing. What had happened is we uh, basically the connection from the water line to the water heater had busted <gasps> and uh, flood, flooded basically two thirds of the mobile home. And it was totaled. It was a total loss. So, um, oh, wow. Thankfully, that's what insurance is for. But after going back and forth for a long period of time, my wife and I figured very quickly that we probably would have killed each other uh, if we tried to go through the process of you know building or putting a new house on that property. So we wound up selling a lot and then we moved to this lake, which is um, adjacent to the lake we were on. They're actually connected by a dam. So um, oh, wow. I would think all the, well, the water loss and the water damage you had to be afraid of water. Like, get, get me away from the water. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Running, running water is uh, is is uh, is is one thing, but uh, you know, lake a lake is uh, is uh, a little bit uh, more peaceful and calming. Thankfully, at, right. at least so far. At least so far. Now, Chris and I went through a similar story. I don't think that it. I mean, it wouldn't say that it flooded two thirds of our house, but we have that same scenario where he woke up one morning while I was out of town in our primary residence and the connection between the water heater and the water supply line. I think it was a water heater itself was like, I guess there's a, a shut off valve. So no, on normal, top, yeah. yeah, normal water heater feeds water into it when it, when the, when the tank goes dry, I guess. But for whatever reason that 
valve or that switch or something was broken and it kept feeding water into something that was already full right. and, it, and over and over again it kept on spilling out over for like the last eight hours so we did have to go through the actual renovation and i wouldn't say that we almost killed each other but it was right before our wedding so definitely was super stressful if we could have just sold the land and bought something for the same price we totally would have but now we're sitting in our our beautiful new house and we completely empathize with that story. Water loss is never great. Uh, yeah, no, it's not. But I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear you guys survived the, the episode. Yeah, definitely. Now, living in Atlanta, is that something that you've done your entire life? Or did you move to Georgia at some point? So it, it's interesting because most of the people that I meet or talk to or get inter- introduced to in and around Atlanta seem to have come from other parts. But I was actually born in Atlanta. I did most of my growing up in Athens, Georgia, which is right up the road, home of the University of Georgia. Wound up moving in the middle of high school, which at the time I was none too happy about, but wound up moving in the middle of high school over to South Carolina for a couple of years where I graduated uh, high school. And then when I went to college, my basically my whole family kind of migrated back to the uh, Atlanta area. So I've, I kind of feel like Georgia generally and, and Atlanta specifically is, is, you know, feels like home to me. Yeah, it's hard to find a native, what do I say, Atlantean, Georgian? What's the word? Like, what are you if you've uh, been from I, Atlanta? I, I've always heard it called Atlantan. Um, Atlantan. Atlantan. Okay. Huh, okay. I was going to say like an Atlantis, but it's when we've talked with a number of different people from Georgia, they te- seem to be transplants. And I think that's very similar in San Diego where we live. Oh, it's very, very is, much so. There's not a lot of people that can say that they are native to the oh, area. Yeah. I was just going to say, except for Chris. That's right. <laughs> Born and raised. So what is it that you do there in Georgia to be able to have a beautiful lake house and a regular house? That seems like you've been pretty successful. I've been blessed. My my wife and I both have. So first and foremost, I'm uh, I'm happily married. Uh, my wife and I are going to celebrate our 26th uh, anniversary here in early May. Congratulations, um, buddy. She uh, yeah, thanks. She's I'm, I'm I'm married up. She's great. She <laughs> works. She works too. We have a dog. No kids. We're actually in the midst right now of trying to figure out if we want to jump back into the foster dog game. We, we uh, volunteer with a local rescue group. So over the last several years, we've had adult dogs, puppy litters, and everything in between in our house for anywhere from a few days to a few months to try to you know get them out of boarding and ultimately get them, get them adopted out to, to good families, which is fulfilling work, but it is, it is work, but we love to do it. And then, yeah, so professionally, I'm a financial uh, advisor or a financial planner, as many people often refer to me as I am in the wonderful position of helping people make sense of their money. And I think many people mistakenly think that all I do is is help them invest or manage their investments. And that's that's a an important part, but a small part of all that I do with my clients. And it's it's really rewarding and it's really uh, fulfilling to see see the positive impact I can have in people's lives when I get the opportunity to, to really get to know them, to to get to un- understand, you know, who they are, what's important to them, and then help them align their money with their meaning or, or what's meaningful to them. So uh, it's it's really uh, again, I'm blessed. It's it's wonderful work. I really really love what I do, and I've like like you mentioned at the top of the uh, the episode, I've been doing it for 28 years now. I think it is. Wow. So yeah, so it's been great. That's amazing. So a big question that I have is so many different companies have pensions or like 401ks and things like that. Why is it important for someone to have a financial advisor if they already have something like that set up for their future? Well, so that's a great question. And I'll be the first to tell you that I, I'm not convinced that everybody needs a financial advisor. I believe the the best financial the, the best approach to managing your money and your finances is to keep it simple. And I fully believe that many people out there are fully equipped and capable of managing their money and their finances on, on their own and doing a, a perfectly wonderful job with it. Where I think the role for someone like me makes sense is if someone is working, they're in a, you know, a family situation, they've got kids and they just, you know, their time is at a premium. You know, they're, you know, they're working often long hours when they're not work, they're trying to keep the house, you know, running, they're trying to, you know, they're chasing their kids from, you know, a ball game or a one recital to the next. And so, there's such a premium on their time that they would rather spend their free time 
doing the things they enjoy and with the people they want to spend their time with. And so those types uh, of folks often will come to someone like me and say like, hey, I I think I could probably handle this, but I've got other things I'd rather spend my time doing. And so they'll bring in someone like myself to to help them. And then there are other people that say, I just have a complex situation. I might have a, like you mentioned, Christine, that I might have 401ks and pensions. I might also have stock options or I might own a small business or all of the above. How do I make sense of all this in a manner that supports the life that my family and I want to live? So I find that it's often a, com- not always, but often a combination of, you know, someone that would rather spend their time dealing with life rather than dealing with their money and or it's a it's a situation where maybe they feel that their situation is a little bit more too complex and they would feel better having someone kind of partner with them to make sense of it all. It's kind of like that good old saying goes, do you have more time or do you have more money? Because if you don't have time to deal with it, then, you know, what, what can you afford to, to do? You know, I think some people also, they want to, they're very tight, I would think, too, that they want to try to, like, I don't say penny pinch, but they want to try to figure things out themselves. So, like, we'll try to do it themselves. But so what do people actually do when they do come to you? What's well, the first thing they say? Like, like I want to make my this money last till I die or what? So that's, that's a... That's a big question, Chris. You're, yeah, you're, you're, you're setting the bar high. So it's typically like, so, so I, I work almost exclusively off referrals. So virtually all my new clients come to me via introduction from existing clients or from other professionals like a CPA or an attorney or, or something like that. Typically they, they are introduced to me and they already have some sense of, of who I am and what I do. But what I, what I think people ultimately want to know, whether they actually verbalize it this way or not, is am I going to be okay? It's, you know, am I going to, and, and the other side of that question or the, or the deeper level or layer under that question is, am I going to wind up broken alone? I think, I think to, to some degree, we all have that, that fear that, that is, that lives within us. And that dates back to our prehistoric tribal days where, you know, we took, you know, comfort and safety from being, you know, being with other people, because if you're with other people that helped you get, get fed. It also helped you prevent getting, uh, from getting eaten by a saber tooth tiger. tiger. Right. And so I think if you take that, what I've often heard to referred to as like the lizard part of our brains has basically not changed a whole heck of a lot over, you know, thousands and thousands of years. I think that we still carry a lot of those base fears with us today. And the way that manifests itself with our financial decisions and our money is, am I going to be okay? Am I going to, you know, not get eaten by a saber tooth tiger these days, but am I going to, you know, wind up broke? Am I going to wind up uh, alone? Am I going to be on a, you know, street corner begging for, you know, begging for scraps or whatever the case may be. And, you know, I've met people that have lots and lots of money and, Again, they've never used those words, but at the end of the day, that's what I hear them asking when they ask me things like, am I going to be, am I going to be okay? Do I need to save more? Do I need to invest differently? Can I afford to retire when I want to, et cetera, et cetera? I think it's, I think a lot of those questions are just different manifestations, fear and anxiety. And so to circle back to your question, Chris, I think that's really what people want to know. And whether that's the first question they ask me or whether they ever ask me that question, specifically or not, that's what I ultimately want to to dig into dig into with people to really understand who they are, what motivates them, what makes them ticks, uh, tick, and then hopefully give them over time comfort and confidence and hopefully ease their fears, concerns, anxiety so they can focus on living a great life and they don't have to feel like they're enslaved by, you know, their job, their career, their money decisions, et cetera, et cetera. I will say, following up with that, Russ, that as a woman, there's a lot that I think about when it becomes like when it comes to finances. And I don't know if it's that like provider, not provider, but like the nurturing instinct of me, where it's like I want to make sure that if something happens to me and Chris was, God forbid, left as a widower, would I be creating more of a burden to him financially or would I be setting him up so that he could actually? in the absence of having me, still enjoy his life, even though, because we're a dual income household, he went from being a single dad and being on a single income to now we have a, a much different level in terms of our quality of life, this new home. And I don't want him to be destitute if something was to happen for me, happen to me. So I started working with a financial advisor just about two years ago. We were a little ways into our relationship, but I still constantly have this nagging feeling of, 
I need to do more to be able to bring income in, create more financial stability. And that's a driving force for me, part of why not only I have a day job, but I have my business and I do consulting on the side because I'm always, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because growing up with not having very much money is this scarcity mentality of, I don't want to ever have to go through where he has to worry about making making ends meet because for some reason I might not be in the picture. And I think that sounds a little bit grim, but it's the reality of what I think through. I mean, maybe it was because, you know, I turned 40 about a year ago, just turned 41. And it's like, oh, gosh, I'm getting older now. What am I going to what's my legacy going to be for my husband and my children? So that's a that's a great question, Christine. And I I think it also starts to touch on some other important and related topics. So my focus uh, in my work is predominantly, but not exclusively working with women. So that could be women that are single, divorced, widowed, but it also includes uh, many women that are, you know, in in happy long-term relationships. What I've found uh, in working with women over the years, and I see this time and time again, and and you use use this word, I think, is this, this idea of nurturing and, you know, making sure that you're leaving the world a better place when you're not around anymore. But where that can also introduce some additional challenges, not obstacles, but challenges is women are off, often fall into the caregiver role for children. So as right. your children age or, or launch into adulthood, if they need some support or, you know, you know, a roof over their head for a period of time, um, families, but more specifically women often step into that role. More importantly, as parents and other family members age, women often uh, step into the caregiving role, taking care of aging parents. And so the phrase I often use is just like when you fly commercial and you uh, watch a little video that says, put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you help others. I think that uh, same idea applies here. Where, where where it's maybe a natural instinct for you want to to want to nurture and care for others, you need to make sure that you've got your foundation in a, in a good place financially speaking, so so that you don't unintentionally jeopardize your own financial you know future in an effort to look after or care for others. But I think I think the question about you know wanting to make smart decisions to leave a a good legacy for for Chris in this example, I think it's a I think that exemplifies a lot of self-awareness, which is important when it comes to, to money, especially, I think. And I think that is a an important element of financial planning, which, as I mentioned earlier, extends well beyond just looking at, you know, investment portfolios and how much money do you have in the bank? It's, you know, how, how do my money decisions impact others, both while I'm living and when I'm no longer around? So it's a that's an important topic, and a great one. We could probably spend a, a full hour talking just about that, about the you know, that, that whole scenario. So, Hey Russ, when you have people that come to you and you know, I, you know that the inflation rate has gone through the roof right now. And of course the price of gasoline, I don't know what it is in your neck of the woods, but I mean, it's cheaper to, it's cheaper to, <laughs> you took a, I don't know, to walk to or ride whatever. a horse. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but when you plan those things and, and people are talking about well, how much money they're going to need in the future, and the future is uh, obviously the inflation rate is growing at such a crazy rate right now. How do you kind of like uh, get ahead of the curve with that and kind of plan out what you might need in future years? So that gets to a, a fundamental challenge in any financial decision making because if, if you're if you're thinking about the future, which is unknown and uncertain, you know, first of all, we don't know how long we're going to live. We can make some educated guesses. We can look at our family history and how long our parents or our grandparents lived, what state of health they were in, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a that's a big assumption or a big guess we've got to make regarding inflation. The approach that I take and that I encourage my clients to take is let's use history as a guide. So even though inflation feels like it's going through the roof. Uh, well, it doesn't feel like it. It is going through the roof right now. Yeah, um, We're feeling it at the gas pump and, and pretty much in all aspects of our lives, grocery store, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what has what has inflation looked like historically? And historically, like going back, you know, 80, 100 years, it's averaged somewhere around 3%. So my approach is let's use the long-term average as an assumption for planning looking ahead and then the way we reflect higher prices in or, or reflect reality in our in our decisions is if we say that we're we're using the long term historical average for inflation and let's say it's three percent and 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 your your plan Chris and Christine says you're going to spend uh, let's say a hundred thousand dollars a year adjusted for inflation well let's say we sit down a year from now and a hundred thousand dollars didn't didn't cut it because right. prices have gone up so much well. 
that's a, that's a way to kind of take current information and reflect it back into your plan. So while I wouldn't necessarily change the inflation assumption in the plan, we could say, well, now we can't, maybe we can't use $100,000 as a annual spending target. Maybe we need to bump that up to $110,000, which would be a 10% increase. And at some point in the future, if and when prices and inflation settle back down more in line with long-term averages, then we could obviously reflect that in our in our spending. There's a there's a different, an important difference between our assumptions and you know what we're actually experiencing in day to day practical you know life, and so it there's some nuance between how do you manage the you know the gap between those two if and when there is a gap. So hopefully that hopefully Chris maybe that maybe gives you an idea of how I I think about or, or look at something like inflation specifically, but more generally just think about you know assumptions that are necessary to kind of build a plan and project into the future. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell what the future should be like, especially when you don't know how long you're going to live. Because uh, Christine was mentioning the other day that she thinks she's going to live till 80. I said 80 <laughs> seems like it's kind of young. but I was thinking that 80 was old, but he brought up a really good point, like looking at the age of our parents and how long they're living. We're like, oh, well. And they're still doing stuff. And they're doing great stuff. And if we were like, well, maybe we're like aiming too low. Maybe we've got to like plan to live until we're like 90 plus. And that gets into my question is so with my job, I work in education for my full time job. And then I have a business separate from that that's pretty successful. But in my career, I can retire as early as 57 and a half, but 63 to get the maximum pension benefits. And one of the things that I said to Chris is, I want to live large. When I retire, I want to like travel. I want to be able to fly, like do the things that I've worked so hard to be able to do. And so it leaves me with this idea of like, well, how much harder do I have to work right now to be able to save up to make that happen? Because I still have bills right now, but I have this dream eventually of being able to like fly to Europe first class and having like a beautiful like two week vacation. Dang it. If I have to work for 23 years to be able to save up enough in my retirement to do that, I'll do it. But it's, I don't want to end up getting to retirement and then living paycheck to paycheck. And do you find that that's happening more and more is that people are, excuse me, holding off on experiences until they retire and then wanting to like live more robustly after they retire? So I think that's kind of the default, um, you know, approach or thinking around retirement. And it's, it's what I refer to um, as kind of this deferred life plan. Like I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to save. I'm going to, you know, pinch pennies, or run a really tight budget. And then once I retire in my 50s, 60s, or even 70s, that's when I can really start to enjoy life. That's when I can really sit back and, you know, enjoy all of the accumulated savings and investments that I've sacrificed so hard to uh, to set aside throughout my career. And I think personally, that's flawed thinking for a lot of reasons, some of which you guys have already touched on. We don't know how long we're going to live. So what if you work, 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 save, 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 uh, work to, I, I think you said the later date, Christine, is 63. Right. Uh, but what if you work to 63, save all this money, you get your maximum pension and other benefits, and then 64, 65, you have you know, an accident or an illness and you pass. You just burst my bubble, Russ. I, I'm not I'm not okay with that. I want to still enjoy life. Well, and that's that's my point. And and I'm sorry for the the morbid <laughs> thought here, but it's but the truth yeah, though. Yeah, that's that's kind of my point. Like why why work so hard and put off really enjoying your life uh, until you're in your fifties or sixties or later? Why not enjoy your life while you're working hard and setting money aside. So you can do both. I mean, at the end of the day, life is not a dress rehearsal. Like we don't get a, like this isn't a practice run and then we can, they, then we can really dial it in and get it right next time. And so it's, it's incumbent upon each and every one of us. It's our responsibility to make the most of our lives. Right. And that gets to this idea of enough. Like what, what is, and this is seldom if ever talked about in, in my opinion among the financial advice industry among financial advisors, the general, the, de- the default is more, more, more. You want more right. investments, more savings. You need to save more. You need to work longer. You need to sacrifice your life so you can have a comfortable, confident future. Well, what if the comfortable, confident future never gets here? So my argument is, let's take another approach and let, let's figure out what do we need to do to have a comfortable, confident future. But once we figure that out, and once we set ourselves on the right path to to head in that direction, how do we make the most of our life today? So rather than thinking, save more, work longer, spend less, et cetera, et cetera, 
Why don't we figure out how we can say work long enough, spend enough while, while still enjoying our financial resources today? So it's about striking this balance. We don't want to be so confident in the future that we're sacrificing our life today. Neither do we want to live so high on the hog today that we're, you know, we're basically relying on a hope and a prayer to be able to, you know, enjoy and live into our 80s, 90s or beyond. So it's it's about striking this balance. And it's going to be different for every single person because, you know, you're Chris and Christine, your priorities, your values, your goals might be very, very different from your best friends. And so that's where the very personal aspect of financial planning comes to the surface and needs to be reflected in your financial decision making, not just in 20, 25 years or longer, but in today. Like, you know, are you are you potentially saving too much money? Are you taking more risk than you need to take? Are you working longer, planning to work longer than you need to? And do you have a do you have a way to to basically look at and analyze the trade-off between those choices to figure out what makes the most sense for you and what's the most comfortable for you today? Hey, Russ, what are your thoughts on Social Security and its future? So I, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's become, you know, this kind of political football. Every time there's a major election, it gets bandied about. And, you know, one side seems to say that, you know, one side always says the other side wants to take it away from you, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, right now, the future of the Social Security uh, Trust Fund looks like it is on shaky ground. So if I was in my Late 50s, let's say if you're, if I was in my 50s and 60s, I don't think that I would think Social Security is not going to be there for you. If you're in your 40s or younger, I would, I would encourage you to either not count on Social Security or to discount it. Like instead of assuming you're going to get the full benefit that the government says you'll be entitled to, maybe right, cut yeah. that in half. And, and I'm not saying that it won't be there. Uh, I'm just saying that I think as time passes, um, Historically, and I, I don't remember the exact stats, but it, historically, it's been like there were multiple current workers supporting every retiree receiving Social Security benefits. Today and going forward, that that ratio is going to flip where there's going to be fewer and fewer current workers supporting the retiree recipients of Social Security uh, benefits. And so that math is not going to work long term unless they adjust the program by making the retirement ages longer, by making more of our earnings subject to taxation for Social Security, none of which is, you know, going to be necessarily a popular solution, but I think something will need to be done. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. I think that, I think Social Security is not going away, but I'm not sure that it will look the same in 10 or 20 years as it does today. And so for people that are planning to retire in 10 or 20 years or longer from today, they might want to adjust their expectations accordingly. So so when I pay into my social security each paycheck, where does it go then if I don't get that money back? It goes into a fund that funds people that are already drawing social security? Well, you know, this gets into some murky ground and I don't want to turn this into a political discussion, but, you know, that money goes into a... There's this thing called the Social Security Trust Fund. That money goes supposedly into a pool of funds that would then go to pay out benefits to current recipients. Um, the Many people would argue that the, the trust fund is nothing but a bunch of IOUs because politicians on both sides of the aisle have spent or committed those funds to you know other programs, other areas of the economy or what have you. So there are a lot of people that feel that all of the money that we're paying into Social Security is either being spent elsewhere or it's going to fund current Social Security benefit recipients or both. And that is one of the big problems, which is, you know, is the money going to be there to fund future Social Security benefits for future retirees? And there are an equal number of people that say, yeah, it's fine. Business as usual. Don't worry about it. And there's an equally vocal uh, number of people that say that, yeah, the Social Security uh, Administration is going to run out of money in the next, you know, 10 or 15 years. And, you know, we need to fix it or, you know, you need to, uh, again, count on, uh, you know, finding another way to support yourself. You know, if they if they came out tomorrow and said Social Security, you know, Administration is being disbanded and the benefits are going away, I think we'd have, you know, mutiny. Oh, I right. think we'd have a, 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 a revolution. And there are so many people that, that are retired that Social Security makes up a large percentage uh, of their retirement income. If of not supporting all. Their, yeah, yeah, of supporting their lifestyle. So if, if that were just to evaporate tomorrow, I mean, there'd be some, I mean, that, that would have ripple effects throughout the economy and through the healthcare system. It would, it would be a mess. So I don't know how they're going to fix it, but it, I, I, I believe that they're there are steps that need to be taken to uh, put it on much uh, much surer footing than it appears to be on right now. 
So that's really interesting for me to learn about Social Security. So I have not been in the system of earning Social Security since I was 21 years old when I had my last job or 22, my last job really? waiting why is, tables. Why is that? Well, because I work in California for uh, the state of California and I get I pay into the state teacher's retirement uh, pension. So it's called STRS. And we have a different dynamic, but I know that there's been a lot of conversations even in that publicly funded pension about increasing costs of pension because it used to be when I first started into teaching, if you were to retire as an educator by like 62 and a half, then you would retire with a certain percentage of your pension. And then they were giving this golden handshake where you got lifetime benefits because it was less expensive to get people out of the actual teaching profession and onto retirement than it would be to keep funding them while they were working because it just comes from different pots of money. But I know that as inflation has increased, as the strain on the state budget has increased, that there's been a challenge with these matching contributions that the school districts now have to make, which are making it super expensive to offer any of these other types of incentives. And then people are living longer. And so they're drawing from their pension way longer than was ever anticipated. And so there's conversations about same similar to what you were talking about with the social security dilemma, but as it relates to the state teacher retirement system here in California. And so I think that was where I got a little bit anxious. And I was like, okay, I need to get a financial advisor to help me think about not replacing that funding. But in the event that if I was to retire, the percentage of my retirement wasn't going to be as high as I currently believe it to be, I need to figure out how to make up that difference. And so I don't know how to get out of that kind of dilemma. But I think that there's enough of us that are in this generation right now that are worried about what's going to happen if Social Security benefits decrease or if it goes away altogether. And then if these state-funded pension systems cease to exist in the way that we know them to be. There's so many of us in our 40s right now that would be up a creek. Yeah, and I, you know that that kind of comes back around to this idea of the fact that people are living longer. You know, you, you guys were kind of joking earlier about you know you're going to live to your 70s, your 80s, or 90s, um, regardless of how long you know you guys live or how long I live. Generally, people are living a lot longer than they were just you know even 20 years ago, and so that puts a much heavier burden, financial and otherwise, on things like Social Security, on public pensions, on private company pensions. Where you know when these programs were designed, you know maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago, you know people would work to their 65, and if they lived another five to 10 years, that was kind of average. Now people are retiring in their 60s and they might live another 25 or 30 years. And so, you know, I, I don't think that our social and pension systems have caught up to or have addressed in a thoughtful and meaningful way the fact that people are living a lot longer, which which increases costs, which uh, stretches out benefits over long periods of time. And so whether we're talking about Social Security or uh, a teacher's retirement um, system, pension benefit, or even like, you know, a Fortune 500 company that has that still offers a private pension, pension costs are going up, which is largely a function of the fact that retirees are living longer. And so they have to receive benefits over a longer period of time. A lot of companies over the last 10, 12, 15 years have actually have actually shut down their pension plans. They've actually bought out um, you know, their pension recipients or offered to buy them out simply as a, a way to uh, reduce costs and make, uh, make it more viable to offer you know, alternatives like 401k plan with matching or, or things like that. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have there's not, there's not a simple or even a good answer, but I do think that I do think that you're smart, Christine, to look at um, shouldering more of the responsibility and thinking about ways to not necessarily replace, like you said, but certainly supplement what you might have otherwise uh, anticipated receiving from the teacher's, the teacher's retirement program. Because I just think that as people live longer, and, and again, people's life expectancies are expected to just go up further and further from here. So that aspect of this problem is not going to go away anytime soon. So I, I think that I think you and your listeners would be be wise to, you know, take responsibility and assume that more of the responsibility for future retirement income is going to fall on your shoulders, even if you have access to a program like a, a social security or a teacher's uh, retirement plan or a, a company pension. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And something that you were talking about a little bit earlier is a conversation as Chris and I were preparing for this interview, we were thinking of important topics that we would really want to bring up and have answered from you. And you said that you focus a bit more on women and not exclusively on women, but on women that are a little bit further on in their life. And so we were wondering about some unique scenarios that we see in current events and what you do or what you would do if you were given this type of a a situation with a client. And so one of the things that Chris watched this Netflix show recently, and it was with younger women, but it was The Tinder Swindler. Have you heard of it? Uh, Yeah, my wife and I watched that uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. So we were thinking of this scenario that we see about women being catfished online or swindled into, you know, they think that they've fallen in love with this person that they've met online or even in person that ends up getting them to give them large chunks of their their finances, their nest egg that they spent for so long. So two questions. First of all, have you encountered a situation like that? Or And then second of all, if you haven't or you have, what do you do to help protect your clients from falling into that? Yeah. So I have not, unfortunately, have not in- encountered or experienced that firsthand with any of, of my clients or any family or friends. But I've got to guess if, if Netflix, you know, made a a movie about it. It's probably more widespread than than many of us are, are aware, which is kind of scary to think about. But as far as protecting yourself, and I'm speaking uh, predominantly to, to about women here, but I, I guess this could go uh, to go could go either way. I've heard it said. I've actually had a client say this to me that as as you age, uh, and so this might not be kind of the 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 tender demographic I'm I'm speaking about here, but as you age, a lot of a lot of older men are looking for a, a woman that can serve as a nurse or a purse, meaning they can <laughs> they can they can care yeah. for them, you know, physically as they as they deteriorate from age, et cetera, or and or they can support them financially. And so which I think kind of speaks to this whole tender swindler, you know, phenomenon. And I I think the best thing to do is just always apply a, a high level of skepticism, especially when you're entering a new relationship. And if you're entering a new relationship, and I, and I have told clients this, that, you know, for example, if you're in your 50s or 60s uh, and you're getting remarried, keep your finances. So maybe <laughs> maybe Preach. keep Preach. maybe <laughs> maybe keep uh, keep his, hers and ours. So keep 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 your individual finances separate and then maybe have a joint account where you share where, where you uh, manage shared expenses. That could be, you know, going out to eat or that could be housing if you're living under the same roof, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I, I would be very I would be very wary about, you know, sharing um, or combining finances especially if we're only, you know, weeks or months into, into a new relationship. People actually uh, do that that early? <laughs> well, I mean, apparently they do. I mean, I, I, can't, I, I can't help but wonder how like sensationalized the Netflix documentary was, but I, I guess that happens. I, I'm left scratching my head saying like, what, what are these people thinking? But right, yeah. it's, easy, it's easy for me to say that. And, you know, it's, you know, it's apparently happening. So, so yeah, I, I, I just encar- encourage, you know, be skeptical, take your time, Maybe it is true love. Maybe you've met your soulmate, but that there's no reason to rush into any major uh, financial decisions, especially financial decisions that could, as I referred to earlier, jeopardize your own financial, um, right. you know, your own financial situation in the event things don't work out. And we agree with that. I'm not speaking for Chris, but I am speaking for Chris because we agree oh, with that. You. Yeah a gazillion percent. And we've talked about this before. Maybe we're non-traditional. We've both been married previously and got majorly burned financially by our exes, like financially destroyed. And I know for me, it took me years to crawl back out of that hole and reestablish myself and my credit and my finances. And, you know, Chris, you worked so hard to be able to buy a house on your own. And so when we got married, we were very clear about the fact that and people were kind of judgy about it. Like, we're going to keep completely separate finances. And then we created, like even before the wedding, we created a household budget before I moved in. We talked about who was going to contribute what. We did not want to have a joint checking account. We just decided on ahead of time, like when we go out to eat, how is that going to work? Like who's going to pay? Because I do like to go out to dinner and to feel like my husband is taking care of the family and providing for it. But does that mean that I contribute a certain amount to the household expenses for the month? And then a year into our marriage, we bought our forever home together. And that felt 
very good because I felt equally matched with him and not like I'm just like dr- living in his house, even though, you know, we were sharing expenses and all of that. But we also talked through, do we want a prenup? Do we want a postnup? Is this something that we want to do? And I think that especially as you get later in life, you when you walk into relationships and you're younger, you can be so naive and you're building your life together and everything is so shared. But as you get later on in life and there's new relationships starting or ending, finances can become so dicey. Like, you know, living with somebody or being married to them in California for 10 plus years, if you were to d- get a divorce or separate after that, they're entitled to half of your pension. They are? Yeah, they are. And I had to navigate that. Like, how do I keep my former spouse from taking half of my pension? Because even though we worked in the sta- same system, I was an admin, he was a teacher. My pension was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars more than his. And so it can get so dicey. But I think that not rushing into things, having really open conversations about finances is important. And then if all else fails, like get something legal to protect yourself. Yeah, I mean, when you're when you're younger, typically you have a abundance of time ahead of you, and and generally speaking, you have less financial resources that you've accumulated. As you age, as you rightly pointed out, Christine, you typically have had time to accumulate more financial resources, so you probably have more money, but you also have less time ahead of you, so you've got less time to recover from a potentially devastating financial decision or mistake or whatever the case may be, whether that's whether the, that's involving a, a relationship with someone else or or not. And so, so yeah, as you as you accumulate more, as you save more, as you age, you just need to be more more skeptical and more wary about jumping into any financial decision, whether that's again whether that's related to a relationship with someone else or just on your own, because you're going to have less time ahead of you to uh, to make to make make up or to kind of write the write the situation. You also hit on something which I think is extremely important, which is uh, the emotional aspects. You know, so so many people, and, and I'm not casting judgment here, so mm-hmm. many people wrap up money and emotions. Right. Um, and and I, I don't think there's, frankly, I don't know that there's a way to avoid that. And so I think that, you know, if some of your friends or family were, you know, maybe a little judgy about the fact that you guys elected to keep your finances separate, well, that's probably because they, they have some emotions around the fact that um, they believe or they've been led to believe or they've grown up with the belief that, you know, money is a manifestation of a caring relationship. And if you don't, you know, share everything equally or, you know, don't combine everything, then maybe maybe that reflects differently than something they're accustomed to. I I have no training in psychology, but I would actually say 80% of what I do is psychology and, and, and around you know human behavior because right. um, telling people this is the smart thing to do with your money if you want to be able to retire or if you want to be able to educate your children or if you want to be able to pay off your mortgage one day, et cetera, et cetera. Telling, telling people that is one thing. Actually showing them or motivating them to make the right decisions is something completely different. And that's why the work I do is endlessly fascinating because it involves humans. And you know we're we're often our own worst enemy. Oftentimes when it comes to our finances, the, the best thing to do is, is nothing. Like I often tell people like, don't, don't just do something, stand there. But, you know, people want to, people want to, um, you know, do things or feel like they're in control or feel like they need to be making decisions when often the best thing to do is just, you know, get on with living and let, let, you know, let life take its course and your money will, uh, again, if you're making smart fundamental decisions, if you've built some good money habits or set some good automations up around your money, a lot of that stuff will just take care of itself. Absolutely. And just to clarify, so when our situation, our family was totally on board with us keeping separate finances. I think it's friends and people that are more in our age group that may have, may have been in those long-term relationships. And like you said, they have that more emotional belief about money. But our parents, I, I remember when I was talking with my parents, they're like, that's a really smart idea. Definitely. Like, absolutely. Really? Keep your they, finances they said separate. that? Yeah. I mean, I think that so many people after seeing us, what we went through and you have to rebuild, it's it's really exhausting to try and have to like pull yourself back up again and reestablish yourself. And, you know, I always think about what would have happened, Chris, if we would have been married from the beginning and how much of a different position we'd be in as a couple. Like, we'd, we're a power couple. High oh, five to us. High five to us, <laughs> indeed. But, Russ, also I was thinking is that I think, too, is a lot of people do is with that the old school mentality of everybody joins everything in one account. It doesn't kind of uh, stem from the uh, not being stereotypical here, but saying like the male would be out, out working, the wife would be stay home, so they would do a joint account, so, or, so she would have the money in the account, so she can pay the bills, et cetera, et cetera. 
I think I think there's probably some truth in that. I, I think that you know whether it's the one spouse or the other is the primary breadwinner. You know, oftentimes the the other spouse that's not the primary breadwinner like kind of runs the checkbook. I, I encounter right, it a lot yeah. of times. But I, again, I think that's just I encourage people to look at every situation, every decision with a fresh set of eyes, and not assume that you know just because this is the way that your friends or family have always done things that it's the right way for you. So, and I, I think. I'm glad you mentioned, Christine, like your parents were supportive and encouraging of y'all's decision to keep things separate financially. Um, but, and I suspect that's because they had some insight into your previous experience and right. you know what didn't work out. Your friends don't necessarily have that same level of insight or context with why you're making those decisions. And so they're, they can only make decisions or judgments based on what they see. And that, again, raises another interesting but all too common topic. People don't talk about money. And I'm, I'm not saying they right. should, but, you know, people just don't know. Like, I don't know what my best friends earn. I don't know if they have a positive net worth or not. I don't know what kind of financial situation they're in, nor do they know what kind of financial situation I'm in. And so the only way we can really judge how we think other people do, are doing is by what we see, you know, our our interpretation of how we see them living. And that's... That's flawed for a whole bunch of reasons. But, you know, people live in a big house. They drive a nice car. They send their kids to a great school. Well, obviously, they're doing well. But are they? We don't know. So I, I think it's money is just, again, it's, it's, it touches every aspect of our lives. It's such this emotional topic that nobody's, you know, comfortable talking about. So that just adds more, you know, more gravitas to the, to the topic. And it, it's just, it's just, it's tough. And so I think one of the reasons or one of the, possible benefits of having a financial advisor is having someone that you can have a, uh, a safe, uh, trusting conversation with about money because who else can you talk to other than maybe your partner, or your spouse. And so having a, someone else you can talk to about money that, um, and this is important that it's not their money. So they can actually talk to you objectively about, well, right. Um, because they don't share your emotions around your money. And so I would say that's another potential benefit of working with a financial advisor, or financial planner they is get in the game. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, and, and they can help maybe help you think a little bit more dispassionately or a little bit more rationally about what is otherwise an emotion filled topic. All right. You bring up a really good point. And as this is Women's History Month, and we're wrapping out Women's History Month with this episode and talking about, you know, how women can take more, take charge financially of their future. One of the things that I found super rewarding is that one of my best friends, she and I have actually very open conversations about our finances and our earnings. And I find that there's not a lot of people that I can do that with because I have been in my industry for 18 plus years and make a very solid income that sometimes when you're talking about finances with other people, you don't want to come across as bragging. And so that's also the benefit of when I meet with my financial planner, that we're able to have those conversations and set goals, but also having a friend that I have that open and honest relationship with where we're setting goals for each other, like challenging each other in terms of when we're going out for a promotion you know, what should that salary ask be? What are we investing in? What are things that, you know, when one of us goes on a shopping spree, like not judging each other for it, but being like, great, I'm so glad that you treated yourself for that. And, you know, what what are you going to do with your next bonus? Are you going to put it away? And, you know, we talk about things like that. But it's like you said, I think that there's things that become taboo topics that you just don't bring up very often outside of, you know, intimate conversation with your partner. And it's like politics, religion, and money. Those are the things that can bring any type of dinner conversation to a or, halt. Or a first date. Or a first date, for sure. Yeah, yeah or, or throw sex into the mix and then all bets are off. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I, I, I think it's awesome that you've got – that you're able to have those conversations with Chris, obviously. But I think it's also, also great that you've got a friend that you can have those conversations with. I, I, I think most people don't have someone like that. Right. And, and the importance of having that friend and or a financial advisor or someone that you can have those conversations with, it doesn't have to be a financial advisor, is um, having someone that you can celebrate your wins with. Yes. I mean, let's let's say you do get a bonus and you spend some, but you also save some or you, you get to the point where you pay off your mortgage or you hit your savings goal. Like who, who can you tell that to without sounding like I'm looking down my nose at you because I did this and I don't know whether or not you're in good financial shape or not. So I right, think yeah. I think having someone, regardless of who that someone is, that you can celebrate your financial wins with. Because again, 
money's a taboo topic. We, we typically don't talk about it with anyone, uh, let alone talk about where we've had success or where we've made good decisions or where we, where we have reached goals that we've set for ourselves. Uh, and I think that's hugely important. And, and it's not done often enough where we don't get the opportunity to pat ourselves on the back and say, hey, look at me. I, I, I did good. I made a smart decision. I followed through. I stuck to my commitments. And you know, having someone that you can have those celebrations with, I think is super, super important. Well, Russ, we have listeners from all over the country and all over the globe that turn that tune into our episodes every week. And so I was wondering, do you only provide services and supports for individuals that live in the greater Atlanta area? Or can our listeners reach out to you and get support no matter where they are? Uh, yeah, so with the, and, and I was actually um, a avid Zoom user pre-COVID. But yeah, with technology, with phone, email, Zoom calls, Microsoft Teams, you name it. For me, geography is not an obstacle. So the majority of my clients are in and around Atlanta, just because that's where I've spent the bulk of my career. But I have several clients scattered around the country, some of whom I've never met in person, but I've worked with them for Years and years and years. So the, the short answer to your question is I'm, I'm perfectly uh, comfortable and capable of working with anyone in the uh, U.S., regardless of their location, as long as they're comfortable working with someone remotely. In fact, I even have a, a client that uh, lives in Japan that I've worked with for uh, for several years. Wow. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, so geography is not a not an obstacle or challenge for me as long as it's not a obstacle or challenge for for your listeners. Fantastic. Now, where can our listeners connect with? Uh, the best thing to do is go to my website. It's wealthcareforwomen.com. And you can learn a little bit more about who I am and why why it's so important for me to work with and support women, especially women that are in their 50s and 60s as they kind of look ahead to retirement and life beyond retirement. But you can learn more about me, read some of my writing. I've got a weekly email newsletter. If, if it's of interest, you can sign up for that uh, as well. That's probably the best place to go. The next next best place to go is I'm pretty pretty active on LinkedIn. So if you're on LinkedIn, you can find me there as well. Fantastic. Well, Russ, we really appreciate you being here with us today. Any final words of wisdom for our listeners? You know, just uh, first of all, thank you. So Chris, Christine, thank you. This is, I appreciate the opportunity and I was so looking forward to this conversation and, and it did not disappoint. I've really enjoyed talking to you both and this has been a, a lot of fun. And for your listeners out there, I would, I would just encourage everyone to, regardless of where you're at uh, in uh, your life or financially is start today, regardless of what that means for you, whether that's paying down debt or starting to save or whatever the case may be, just start today. And so often we think that I'll deal with this tomorrow. And before you know it, tomorrow is come and gone and you're 60 years old and you're kind of looking at yourself in the mirror and wondering where, where the last 20 or 30 years went. So regardless of where you're at today, uh, get started, whether that's educating yourself and, and tackling this yourself, which I think you're likely capable of doing or seeking help from a uh, financial planner or a financial advisor, just get started because regardless of where you're at, regardless of your age, the best time to start is right now. Fantastic. I like it. Well, thank you so much, Russ. And we look forward to hearing about the amazing things that you continue to do for women and all people financially. Thanks so much. This has been a lot of fun and I, I really, really, truly appreciate the opportunity. Hey there, K2 crew. We love having you as our loyal listeners. To keep up to date with what's happening behind the scenes, check us out on social media. Yeah, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter. And don't forget to follow our Facebook page. Yeah, tag us in your favorite fun stories and guess what? You might just end up on the show. Ooh, ooh. You know, Russ was great for uh, coming on the podcast today. He definitely was. And I think that like when he was saying about how with inflation, you really can't plan for inflation, but you kind of have to adjust a little bit. And I know that um, a lot of people try to like uh, base their projections of what they should be putting in their 401k. I know what I had my 401k like years and years ago. They had this thing where it would be like, okay, if you put X amount of dollars in, your projection should be this amount of much money when you do retire. And and back then, it sounded like a ton of money. You're right. Like, Four hundred thousand dollars. That's like I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm rich. <laughs> but then you're like realizing with inflation rates, you really that, that four hundred thousand dollars. I mean, if you, if you have a current mortgage or a, or I mean, even your house is paid off, but even that, you're gonna need other stuff to pay for things and gas and just with gas alone, that four hundred thousand dollars would be gone. Well, you have a pension though too, right? I do this company. I do now. I'm talking yeah. about the other company you worked for years and years ago when uh... I first got interest. When I first saw a four hundred one k. I had no idea what a 401k was back then, but I first went to their thing and their orientation. They gave me all this stuff and they 
broke down the numbers and all that stuff and figuring everything out. Kind of mm-hmm. like this is how much money you could make in, you know, when you retire at age 90 <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. Well, I think that one of the things that Russ was talking about really got me thinking about your yours and my future. So I know that you've talked about like getting your 401k and your pension and everything set up. And I've talked about my side of the street. But then I started to think about well, what is that going to look like for both of us? Because, you know, you are a lot older than me. No, I'm not. And you're going to be, you know, retiring like 15 years before me, old man. Like, aren't you just like two years away from retirement right now? Baby, I would retire today <laughs> if you would let me. I, I, I keep let asking you. Christine, can I, can I retire? You keep baby? saying, can I, will you be my sugar mama? I didn't say it like that. I, no, I, you didn't say it. You were just like, honey. I'll be a stay-at-home dog dad for you. I'll be. Uh, no, I will be the king of the castle here. I will help you out and stay here. I'll be podcasting day and night. Yeah, that's not what we all want. What I said to him is, sure, if you want to take care of all of the meal prep and all of the cleaning and take care of managing the kids and not have a temper when you're with them and help them with their homework <sighs> and all of those things. Long, longest sigh of all time. <laughs> oh, my God. Nobody oh. wants to hear that, Chris. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that, but... Uh, in all reality, I have been thinking about the fact like we're going to retire like 20 years from now, I think is like le- like not legally, but technically, according to my retirement calculator, when I can retire. And what's the world going to be like in the year 2042? And how are we going to prepare for that? Well, you know what? I think you really have to start saving. I guess, like he's saying, is save more and just put keep putting more. But then at some point, there's a tipping point too. You you can put like your entire paycheck if you really can afford it into your retirement. Yes, you can do that. Yes, but but, like, then it, the, but you're really like living. But also, you gotta balance it out. That's what Russ was saying, though. Yeah, too. you don't want to like live off uh, gold. Dave Ramsey always says, "Rice and beans. You gotta get the rice and beans. The rice and beans rest your life." Who wants to do that? Right. You know, uh, but you got a big retirement. Yeah, whoopsie, whoopsie do. Then you die tomorrow and then you lose <laughs> it. And then your kids get it. They want you to give your kids all your money that you worked hard for, you suffered for. I and, don't want to do that. And you know what I found out with my pension is if I don't designate a beneficiary, then it's, and if something happened to me, then that just disappears. And so all that to say, folks, whenever we bring on guests like this, the hope is that it'll help you engage in some great conversations with your partner or with your financial planner or whomever to make the most informed decisions for yourself and to really be planning for how are you going to live your best life now and also prepare to live your best life in the future because it's not an either or. And I think that's what so many people think is like, either I have fun now or I have fun later. But I think it's like that old adage of, Everything in moderation, right? Well, when you're younger, I know when I was like, say, 20, 21, retirement, pff, what's that? I don't even think about that stuff, you know? Like, you don't even care. I don't know about that. I mean, when I was 22, I started saving for retirement. Maybe I saved for the weekend. <laughs> I, I, would save, I would save for the cover charge, get into the bar. But That's- the difference is when I was 22, I was a full-time teacher. I got married at 23. I was pregnant with my first child by 24. So I think I had to grow up fast and like had to like prepare for the future early. And so a different kind of future. I think, yeah. that, you know, it's, it's like, um, it's like, I know some people do get married like right out of high school and they do the whole family thing. I mean, you weren't quite that early. No, I cro- I graduated college. I know I'm saying, but people do. They'll get pregnant, high school, married, you know, they'll have their gra- high school graduation and then do a wedding, wedding ceremony, which reminds me, do you think, what was the youngest uh, bride and groom you ever got married? Your uh, off topic. <laughs> Back on topic, squirrel. So you were saying like some people start planning earlier in life and later in life. Well, and I would say that. How much saving you possibly do at 18? Like you couldn't have any, you can't have any formal Okay, by then you have nothing by then are you sure uh, by 18 all right listeners if you're 18 years old and you have a 401k please reach out i to didn't us. say they don't have a 401k i'm saying what could possibly be in it well i mean you never know that's why we want our listeners well, unless you have rich parents and dump a bunch of money in there yes i get that i'm saying for the rest of us that actually have to work for our, all of our money that don't get dumped cash in our laps oh my gosh okay ladies and gentlemen chris is officially on his soapbox so as i was saying listeners If you are a young person and you already are contributing to a 401k or you're very retirement focused, we would love to hear more from you. We would actually love to hear from all of our listeners about any truth nuggets that you found in this episode that you think stood out for you. 
And it's been a little while since we've had a little bit of listener mail into the inbox, Chris. So where can our listeners find us by email? Okay, you can email us to Chris and Christine Podcast at gmail.com. That's Chris and Christine with K's. You always can go to our website, which is Chris and Christine Show.com. And you can spell that any way you want. And there's an email button on there as well. And there's a new cool toy, which I have not put on the website yet. But, but I was thinking about maybe doing this because other shows do this. It's like a voicemail button of some sort. And I got to figure this whole cool technology. <laughs> That's going to be creepy. Well, there is a uh, way where you click a little button on the website and it like leaves like a little voicemail like three minutes or two minutes i think you think they set it up okay and it basically drops into some kind of email box or something and i don't know how it works exactly but uh i know it's a popular tool a lot of their podcasts do that and it'd be kind of fun the thing to make it once i figure how to do that i'll put it on the website that's my problem i try to figure this stuff out and it takes you forever to figure this stuff out and then by the time i figure it out it's already too late. We're on the next thing. So you are so hyper tonight. All I of that, have to be, you know, all of that to say, folks, if you are wanting to give us like an audio recording, you can record something on your iPhone and email it on over to us with your thoughts and feelings about this episode this week or any of our most recent episodes. And uh, who knows? You might just end up on the show. Right, Chris? Absolutely. I would love to start playing podcast. Uh you know, call in. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> well, again, where can our listeners find us? At Chris and Christine show.com. And guess what? The link is in the show notes right below. See that player you're looking at? Yeah, that thing. Yes. Right below there. It's in the show notes. Thank you so much. And we'll be back with you next week. 